Welcome to Racing Roots with Ham. If you don't know our host, David Ham, he's a 25-year NASCAR veteran, engine builder, and jackman. Live every Monday evening, we have a new guest from the racing world with their stories, their paths, their their racing racing roots. roots. Sponsored by Jersey Cape Yachts. Check them out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and their YouTube channel. Also on JerseyCapeYachts.com. Be sure to hit that subscribe, turn on the bell notification, so you'll be notified every time we go live. Now here's our host, David Ham. All right, here we are. We're live, and uh, hey, everybody, welcome to Racing Greets with Ham. And there's always at least one that'll have their phone turned up or whatever, but that's okay because mm-hmm. we're here. We're having a good time. We're already halfway through the show, and then we realize, oh yeah, we got to hit the uh, go live button. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so I got Brad Gillian with me tonight. How exciting to have you in! Uh, how exciting to be in! This is awesome. I, I've I've actually I've I've been to Statesville, but mm-hmm. I've never like been to Statesville. Yeah. You know, so it was kind of cool driving in and driving around town and all of that. So yeah. this is a an awesome place to be. It's a happening town, isn't it? I mean, we've got lights. We still got Christmas lights up. I like that. Well, you know, I mean, it's not June yet. At least that's my rule at home. <laughs> yes. So. Well, and we do have lights out on the street as well. They were saying that should we leave them up? And then, uh, me and Billy Buck were like, yes, you need to leave them up. So, uh, but I also got Kathy Cash here, and uh, Dawn Clark is in with us as well. She's taking the place of Phil. She doesn't quite have the vo- the loud voice. I don't that, have the Phil voice. The Phil tonight. voice like this right here. Yes. Hmm. <laughs> and uh, Phil Cavalli, he's down in Florida. He's going to uh, Volusia. Oh wow! To the races, and I was invited, but I bet he's already gotten rid of that one ticket he had left. I told him, I said, "This is what's going to happen. I'm going to come all the way down there, and you're not going to have one ticket left." So. I just won't even won't even go. That's the way it goes, right? Yeah, it's a long it way is. to go to not have one ticket. Yeah, but I've actually done one of my shows from Volusia. Oh, very cool. Sitting out in the parking lot. There was nobody else there. There wasn't a race going on, but I got to meet the general manager, uh, track manager kind of thing. Awesome. And it was good. So, um, yeah, it's exciting to have you. Where did you have to come in from? Uh, Concord. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I don't live too far from Charlotte Motor Speedway, so. All right. So, yeah. where do you do your show out of Sirius XM? Mm-hmm. I actually, so I do, um, I, I could work out of the house if I want to, but I actually do all of my shows from the, uh, the PRN studios, which are at Charlotte Motor Speedway, because, well, quite honestly, we have really nice studios there yeah. and it's super convenient. So, sure. Yeah. yeah. Right. I know, uh, Jeff Hammond's actually kind of like my neighbor up there, uh, towards Cleveland. He mm-hmm. lives out this way. So out off of highway 70. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, I know. Yeah. I thought about going back that way, and then I was like, wait, that's going to take me to Salisbury. So yeah. It does. A <laughs> little bit of a, Yeah, I mean, there's some back roads. We'll talk about that, though. You know, you can go by the old uh, Earnhardt shop down. Wait, uh, wait. Been that way? I like that. Yeah. Maybe a good idea. Highway 3, which used to be 136, but mm-hmm. they changed it. So how long have you been in this area? So I moved to Charlotte from Fort Worth uh, three years ago now. Three, literally a month shy. Uh, I mean, pretty much almost a month shy today okay. of uh, living here for three years. I mean, I've been coming here for so much longer than that, you know, just mm-hmm. with PRN and with NASCAR and all of that. But um, I actually made the move here three years ago. Okay, very cool. Mm-hmm. So you have a, a good radio voice. As Dawn said, I could probably take some pointers. I'm not sure if that's yeah. what you meant. Did but, I say that? <laughs> no, maybe I'm you didn't. Sorry. I was thinking that. Yes. You know, it was funny. When I first started, like in the business, I was, I was um, working at a rock station in Dallas. And that was mm-hmm. always like a big thing because in the early 90s, it was like, oh, you got to have the big booming, you know, rock station voice. And yeah. here I am. I sounded like a little kid. I mean, I was like 22 years old and I never thought about it. But, but mm-hmm. and people said that. And it's a huge compliment. Don't get me wrong. Mm-hmm. But um, it's it's like I, I, I always think to myself, this is just kind of how I talk. So yeah. I guess I guess I'm it's one of those people is, that, right? that always talks like that. Yeah. I was going to turn Kathy on in case she had to say something to say. So, hey, Kathy. I mean, so far, I don't think of anything I could say. Yes, okay, very good. So, uh, yeah, so you probably went, or were you in radio when you went through the whole puberty change of voice and all that, you know? The- <laughs> yeah, maybe. I don't, you know, that might have been at 25, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, speaking of that, we have a, a kid. He's, I guess he's 17 now, Presley, Bar- Presley Barker. Mm-hmm. The first time we had him on the yeah. radio, he was probably, what, 13? 11. 11, okay. Mm-hmm. Wow. Time flies. Yeah. And, and so, but he's, he's now, he's like, big, hit the big time. He's, He's going to be American on American Idol. Idol. No kidding. Yes. Yeah. This oh, that's season. awesome. Yeah. Also, another one of our guest artists from Pigment Folkways, Mason Via. Mason Via, yes, that's yeah. right. He will be, be on there, there as well. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's really cool. Yeah, Both it, of them. It Sunday. is, yeah. yeah. So I emailed their, no, actually, yeah, I emailed their publicist. They have the same yes. one to get them <laughs> to come, to give them a uh, call in. So, mm-hmm. and I actually have their songs. But anyway, yeah, so he went through the change in his voice a couple of times when we had him in as he was singing but then now he's went through voice lessons and it's all good he's on the other side of it 
Yeah, that's, that's cool. Something I thought of at the moment. So. Yeah, I, I had a buddy um, back when I was working at the radio station in Dallas. His name was Chris Ryan, and he was from Gilmer, Texas, which um, Gilmer, mm-hmm. Texas is, I believe, actually where Don Henley was born. Okay. Yeah. Um, and yeah. he grew up in, uh, in Linville. Lindale, Linville. Anyway, yeah. um, but Chris <laughs> was working at a Dairy Queen. Oh yeah, you know, in Gilmer, and someone who owned a radio station came through the drive-through and heard him. He was like, "Oh, you should get in the radio." And, and now Chris is a very successful voice actor and you know, voiceover artist and everything. So yeah, yeah. Some people that? it just comes way I'm, natural. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little worried that Phil's going to get uh, swiped up. I was playing my intro for Billy Buck, and he's like, "Who is that?" Like immediately when he heard Phil's voice. But that's fine, <laughs> Billy. You like my voice now. <laughs> Anyway, so, all right, so this show, this show is about you, and it's about your story, your racing roots. Uh, but, so I'd like to hear you from the beginning. Like, you were born on a rainy day, and no, I'm just kidding. You don't have to get through all that, but you were born in Texas. I was not born in Texas, actually. He wasn't, okay. Yeah, yeah, it, it, shh, don't tell anyone. No, I'm kidding. Oh. I, was, uh, I was born in New Jersey. Okay. Um, and lived there until I was six years old. Mm-hmm. Um, literally on my sixth birthday, I can remember backing out of our house in Hillsboro, mm-hmm. Texas, and we moved to uh, Houston. In fact, literally just this past weekend, I was uh, back down in Texas, and I was mm-hmm. over at uh, my parents' house with my girlfriend, and. I, I didn't remember the why or any of that stuff, why we moved to Texas and what we did. But, you know, we were originally going to go to Austin and then we were going to go to DFW. But we ended up moving to Houston um, when I was six and lived there until um, almost in ninth grade, uh, I, like a week before spring break when I was in eighth grade. And then we moved up to Fort Worth. And then that's where I pretty much grew up and had lived up until three years ago. OK, wow. well, when I had uh, Chris Boucher in here last week, he was saying he was. He claims Texas, right? But he said I was actually born in Florida. Mm. So, but he says Texas is what I claim for my. I, I sold him his first race car. Oh, did you? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. How about that? I know. So, that sounds like a story. <laughs> yeah. All, yes, all part of the thinking. racing story. Yeah. So the evolution. Well, then continue, and then you can get to that part about it. At, yeah. So, so for car. me, um, I, I went to high school in a, a little town right in between Dallas and Fort Worth called Euless, Texas. I mean, it's basically the south end useless. of DFW Airport. Mm-hmm. Useless, mm-hmm. yes. Um, <laughs> right. And uh, and then I went to college in Huntsville, Texas, north of Houston, uh, Sam Houston State University. And when I went to college, I was always interested in uh, either radio or teaching, you know, mm-hmm. or some type of criminal justice. But radio, for some reason, radio, television always attracted me. Mm-hmm. So those were the, all the classes that I took. And um, when I was in my last year there, I ended up working at the school radio station, which was a lot of fun because the school radio station, it was like, come in here for three hours. Here's all of our albums and CDs. Just play what you want. Yeah. And it was yeah. great. Oh, but, yeah. But we had a country station in town as well, which was a commercial radio station that I did an overnight shift on, Okay, um, which was just so much fun. And, and literally, that was like the best year of college in my life because I had no free time. Um, I, I, I had only time to work and do my schoolwork, so I couldn't put anything off, and it was just a lot of fun. But when I left college, um, my first job, it, it, I mean, that story is almost like right place at the right time it feels like about a hundred different times because I left college and I went to, uh, go intern at, uh, well, I started interning, um, when I was in college at uh, a radio station, KEGL in Dallas. Mm -hmm. And at the time it was the top 40 station. It was the all hit 97.1, the Eagle about three weeks after I started interning there. Um, I remember I called up to the guy who, um, I was, you know, reporting to, and I was on hold for an inordinate amount of time, long enough to realize that they were playing the Eagles' Life in the Fast Lane over and yes. over and over again. <laughs> okay. They were changing formats to a rock station, which Format turned... Flip. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. what that oh, was. Yeah. Okay. So I got hired to um, essentially run the promotions deal. Now, when I say run the promotions deal, there was a promotions director that I reported to. I was the guy that drove the van and set up the fun and all the parties and all of that. And then three months later, I started working on the air overnights and, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, moved to mornings um, maybe a year after that. And kind of the rest is history. I worked there throughout the entire 90s. And when I was working there, 
Um, that was about the time they were building Texas Motor Speedway. Yeah. Now, I've always been a motorsports fan. I mean, I've like I've been a Dallas Cowboys fan and a Texas Rangers fan and all of that, but I've never been one of those to just sit at home on Sunday afternoon and I got to watch three football games or anything mm -hmm. like that. I've right. been more interested in racing. My dad and I used to go uh, to the Texas Motorplex every year and watch the drag races. I mean, you know, yeah, when Don Prudhomme was running Funny Cars and mm -hmm. Gary Ormsby yeah, was yeah. Uh, you know setting Fast Time and Low ET and you know Shirley Muldowney, uh, Muldowney and Dan Pastorini mm -hmm. and all of those people. I mean, I, so I, I, I've always loved motorsports and mm -hmm. we would go out to Devil's Bowl uh, Speedway, half mile track out in Mesquite, Texas, where the World of Outlaws ran their first ever race. And um, so when they built Texas Motor Speedway, I was still working at the Eagle and I went out there when it was dirt. There's a lot mm -hmm. of pictures of, of Dale Earnhardt's on a big old huge bulldozer mm -hmm. and Bobby Labonte's out there and Terry Labonte and Rusty Wallace. I mean, that was sort of like the, hey, this is what we're doing out here yeah. on I-35 uh, W and Highway 114. And I got to sort of know some of the people. Well, the first year the track goes by, I go there for every event as a race fan and had a great time. And the second year of the Speedway, um, they invited me out to a, I think it was like the first Legends car race. They actually ran there on the fifth mile track that they built yeah. mm -hmm. out behind turn three. Mm -hmm. So I went out there. That's kind of like Charlotte. They, had yeah. they have, have the fifth mile track experience. outside of turn three here as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So I went there and, and announced the races. First time I'd ever done something like that. I mean, I'd work like for the Dallas stars and the Fort Worth hockey team and different things like that all throughout but but I never announced a race and I've always been I mean just a huge racing fan so then I got hired on as the PA announcer and then in the meantime I had left the Eagle I went to work for the alternative station um, in Dallas for a while and in 2001 uh, they hired me to run the dirt track because we had just built Charlotte at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it was a four tenths mile dirt track, or it is in Texas. I think the one here in Charlotte might be closer to a half mile. Um, but we both built dirt tracks at the same time in 2000. So 2001, I actually was hired full time. I was still the PA announcer. You know, mm -hmm. um, I was running all of the dirt track stuff. Um, I, I, I got roped into running all the legend stuff too, which was fine. But, and that's where I met Chris Busher and his cousin James and all of that. Mm -hmm. Um, Brennan Poole. There's a lot of people that actually came from Texas, um, that have ended up running a NASCAR, which is awesome, which they were just, you know, little kids riding my bicycle around the pits at the time. Yeah. And you wonder some of that is that like going after uh, Texas Terry, you know, the, the Labonis. Yeah. They're yeah. like, you know. No, and he's from Texas, of course. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And um, so I did that. Uh, I ran the short track stuff for a couple of years. Um, during that time, I ended up taking over running fire and EMS. Um, and then our company bought, a, a, and I'm not a fireman or an EMS. I just actually. <laughs> I was wondering. I, that's, yeah, that's not great, at all. Like, no, I, I literally like, managed the department. We okay. had so many smart, wonderful people who did that. And and when you are at any racetrack and you see the, the, the people who are sitting in the fire trucks and any one of the turns or anything like that, mm -hmm. you know, they're pretty much all local firemen and women and paramedics and all of that. And they're amazingly talented and wonderful people. But um then we bought, even though our company, Speedway Motorsports, is the company that builds and produces Legends cars, mm -hmm. um, we didn't own the dealership at the time. Texas Motor Speedway didn't. There was a local Honda dealer. Um, Gene Huggins was a big race fan, and he actually had started a dealership down there. Well, Gene Huggins passed away. Um, his two sons weren't really as interested in something like that, so we bought the dealership from them and brought it back in-house. And I ran that for a couple of years, and, and we raced all over Texas. We would go to Wichita Falls. Mm -hmm. um, we would go down to Kyle, which is between Austin and San Antonio. We would race a lot at Texas Motor Speedway year round. I mean, it was awesome. I, you know, drove a big old truck with the parts trailer and, you know, mm -hmm. operated the races and, and did all the points and did all of that, um, which was a lot of fun. But in 2005, when Texas Motor Speedway got its second race day, because we always had one, yeah. we had the April race weekend, um, and it was always a big push. We need two NASCAR races here at Texas. We finally got that. And uh, Kenton Nelson, who is the assistant general manager, he's still there at Texas, great guy, and a guy from Chevrolet named Brian Mackey. Um, they, they, you know, thought of an idea of something that we can do because, you know, anywhere where racing hasn't literally been a part of the fabric of the community like it is here in the Southeast. Right, yeah. um, you, you listen to a sports talk station and you can hear anything you want about the Dallas Cowboys, the Dallas Mavericks, the Texas Rangers, the Dallas Stars, all stick and ball, which is fine. They didn't really understand NASCAR. Yeah. So we thought, well, what can we do to help with that? So, uh, you know, Kenton and, and, and Brian Mackey had the idea of, 
let's create our own radio show. And that was my background, which was perfect because now I got to take two things I really love, which was radio and racing, and bring them together. So we, we did like an hour-long show that we syndicated throughout Texas and Oklahoma and Arkansas. I mean, we were out in New Mexico and Florida, Michigan, yeah. some really strange places with it, but it was great. And you got low competition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, well, exactly. And really? it, was, you know, it was wonderful. But PRN, who, you know, with whom I work now, um, is a part of our same company as well. So when we were starting the show, we came out and we sat down with Doug Rice, who's the president of PRN, um, who's my current boss, and, you know, said, hey, here's what we're doing. You know, what do we need to really do to get started and all of that? So I'd already known Doug and had a relationship with Doug just from seeing him at the races, but I didn't know Doug. You know, it was, it was you know, very quickly we became very fast and very, very good and very tight friends. So we started that in 05, and then in 06, I actually started working for PRN as well. So I would do my Texas show, and then when we had a PRN race, I would travel to the races. The first race I ever did was, it was in Atlanta weekend. It was a rain delay weekend. <laughs> Jeff Burton had just started driving for Richard Childress, and in the Xfinity series, he ran the Holiday Inn car for the first time yeah. and won. And my, I'm pretty sure that was even the first. It was the first Xfinity race he had run since he had been with Roush and mm -hmm. remember the Gain car and all of those different ones. But oh, yeah. that was the first race I ever worked and then continued to work for PRN. Um, you know, and, and as the years went by, I eventually, uh, Daniel Norwood, who's the program director of Sirius XM NASCAR Radio, um, you know, he and I got to know each other and then he hired me as well to do, you know, five shows a week on Sirius XM, the Monday, Tuesday night late shift show, which I did originally with Buddy Baker, a Saturday press pass, media roundtable show, and then pre and post race shows. So um, I was working at Texas. I was doing the Sirius XM shows and traveling with PRN. Uh, and then at a certain point, something had to give. So um, I had left working with Texas Motor Speedway and stuck with PRN and Sirius XM. Um, just worked out of the house for a while um, until uh, an opportunity came for me to move to Charlotte and work with PRN as a full-time job mm -hmm. in addition to Sirius so We were talking XM. about uh, PRN and MRN before the mm -hmm. show and, and mentioned that, you know, PRN used to be like it was like Charlotte and uh, I want Bristol. I don't know. There was only it a few tracks. Atlanta. It was just Charlotte initially. Sure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so essentially the way the radio networks go is mm -hmm. the way the ownership goes mm -hmm. of the racetrack. So Speedway Motorsports, um, you know, our company, we own Charlotte, Bristol, Texas, New Hampshire, Atlanta. Las Vegas, Sonoma, Atlanta, Atlanta. Uh, mm -hmm. Kentucky Speedway, um, um, and I hope I'm not missing one. We have uh, the deal with Circuit of the Americas because that's mm -hmm. through our company, which we're excited about. Mm -hmm. We also partner with the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Board Radio Network yeah. to do the Brickyard right. Race. And then, of course, MRN does the races at the tracks, which NASCAR owns, mm -hmm. plus the independence of Dover and Pocono as well. So mm -hmm. it divides up to where they do about two-thirds of the schedule and we do about a third of the schedule. You know, which really works out pretty well because I don't know that anyone wants to do the entirety of the schedule. No, <laughs> no I was going to say it gives yeah, you a break. Yeah, it's almost too yeah, much at this sure. point. The thing about it when all of that came to be and it happened was that it it changed the situation in that you had a different viewpoint. Yeah. A different style of covering races from what you'd have with the MRN. Both are equally interesting and good, but PRN is a little more from the start – more enthusiastic, more involved, a little more of the tech end, a little more of the back end, the back story, which I think made it very interesting. And a lot of that has to do with Doug Rice's dedication to the sport that he has had. Oh, big knowing. time. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Doug Rice will tell a story that um, – there was a guy who was running the Indianapolis Motor Speedway radio network. And, and, and uh, for the life of me, I can't think of his name, so I don't want to get it wrong. But <laughs> when I think of him, I think of Felix Sabatis. You know, he was, he was from Cuba, you know, same thing. But he was telling Doug one time, so Doug will tell the story that, you know, well, what do you do? And, you know, Doug's answering, well, I talk on the radio. Well, yeah, but what do you do? <laughs> well, I talk about the race. Yeah, but what do you do? Ultimately, he was getting to what his point was going to be. He said, what business are you in? You're in the transportation business. It's your job to transport the people uh, to the yeah. racetrack who can't be at the racetrack. Yeah. And mm -hmm. as an extension of that, you know, Doug and I, um, we spend a lot of time together when we're on the road. Um, you know, often we're riding to the track together, riding back to the track, from the track together and all of that. And my deal is and his deal is when we leave the race at the end of the day, 
did we tell the story of the race? Mm -hmm. If you were listening to our broadcast and if, if Chase Elliott just won, do you know why Chase Elliott won? Do you know the story? Do you know if Chase Elliott didn't win? For mm -hmm. example, like in the Coca-Cola 600 last year when Brad Keselowski did. Do you know why Chase Elliott didn't win? Do you understand that mm -hmm. uh, Alan Gustafson's pit strategy was different than, uh, you know, what Jeremy Bullen's pit strategy, you know, and all of that. So that's that's what we feel. Did we tell the story? Did we cover everything that went? Who had the inopportune flat tire? Who had the great pit stop? Who made the great lead change? Who had the hero moves on the racetrack? Did we tell the story? And that's really just simply what our goal is. Yeah, so basically you have to be aware of everything that's going on around you, not just watching the leader at the time. Absolutely. Was, yeah. So, David, yeah. Rachel wants to know from Brad, how was it working with Buddy Baker? He was an exceptional storyteller. Buddy Baker, um, I want to go back just a little bit. So Please. the first time I ever met Buddy Baker, before Fox and NBC took over – a full-time broadcasting of NASCAR races in 2001, it was sort of a mismatch. You know, you would have some CBS races, you would have some ESPN races, some yeah. Nashville network yeah. races and all of that. CBS um, always did the races at Texas, and the individual tracks would, would, uh, would put those deals together. So Buddy Baker and Mike Joy were the two main broadcasters for the races and at texas the pa booth was really close to where the television booth was and during the downtime you know um on a given race weekend everyone's just kind of walking around and milling around and talking to each other and you know i mean i'd, I'd probably run across buddy in the halls and all of that but i didn't really know buddy but he was such a wonderfully nice and accessible man i mean the gentle giant yeah. is truly the best nickname that he could have had i mean here's a man who's what you know we'll probably call him six four he was probably closer to about 6'2", but he was just a, an amazing um, human. I mean, just a great man. And I remember him coming into the PA booth, and we're just talking, and you mentioned Buddy Baker's stories. Well, he starts telling a story of getting hurt at a racetrack um, at one point. It was away from Charlotte, and his elbow started hurting him really bad. I mean, it was a bad wreck. And he went to the doctor, and he's like, the doctor wanted to do surgery, you know, on his elbow. And he's like, well, I better wait until I get back to my doctor. And, you know, mm -hmm. his doctor said, hey, you just got like a little shrapnel in here. Let me pick it out real quick. You'd be fine. And Buddy was fine, and he moved on down the road. You know, mm -hmm. he was facing surgery with one doctor out of town and something very simple with his doctor. And his moral of the story was – Always go back home. Always go back yeah. to your doctor. But yeah. the way Buddy could tell the story was great. So yeah. moving forward, when when the Sirius XM NASCAR channel first came into play, actually, Bud, I think it was Buddy and John Kernan were doing their show from the PRN studios at Charlotte Motor Speedway. So then I ran across him again. Um, and then one of my good friends, Jim Noble, started doing the show with him before I did. But, you know, I'd always just kind of cross paths with Buddy. He actually did his first radio broadcast on PRN the night that Jeff Gordon won his first race in the mm. 1995 Coca-Cola 600, which was really cool. Wow. So I had the opportunity to work with him and, and one of the nicest people on the planet. And the buddy that you heard on the air was the exact same buddy that you had off the air. Yeah. And, you know, we would talk during commercial breaks and, <laughs> you know, he would always talk about, yeah, he lived, uh, you know, up in Cheryl's Ford up on Lake Norman. And he would, you know, talk about the people who were on the water and different things with his boat. Mm -hmm. He used to go out and feed the catfish, which, you know, I, I brought up on the air one day, which he wasn't exactly happy about because oh. he was afraid people would go right. fish him out of his, out of his dock. But, yeah. um, it's just such a wonderful man and, and, and an amazing storyteller. And, and when he was sick, it was really, really tough because Buddy was such a tough guy. Mm -hmm. Buddy, this is one of the things I admire really the most about Buddy. Buddy got nominated to the NASCAR Hall of Fame, and he knew he was sick. You know, he, he, he knew he was ill, and mm -hmm. he, there wasn't as much time left. And he never once told anybody about him being sick never once made a deal out of it probably at the time could have gotten a pretty big sympathy vote i mean let's be honest you know because everyone admired buddy baker you right. know even if you were his hardest competitor you still admired him and he never did and he always said and he said this on the air and he said this off the air he said i know i'm going to get in one day the fact that i'm nominated i know i'm going to get in one day and that's enough for me you know, and yeah. it took a few years after that, you know, because, you know, we had the year where a bunch of car owners got in or we mm -hmm. had the year where, you know, uh, it was just, you know, but he's in now, which is a great thing. And but I just always admired him that he never made it about him. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, he always made it about the people that we were talking to and the stories that he was telling. Last time and I saw Buddy he, Baker was down in, uh, in Mooresville at the Lowe's 
And I was standing there looking at light bulbs. I guess he was looking at for a certain light bulb too. And he just come up behind me and tapped me on the shoulder. And I was like, Oh, Hey buddy, how you doing, man? You know, it's just yeah. like I said, he's the gentle giant. He's, I mean, I'm six one and a half, but, you know, <laughs> but he still half. seemed taller, yeah. of course. Yes. But the, um, but the other thing I wanted to say was about the hall of fame, uh, Robert Yates. I went through that whole deal when I was working at Roush Yates engines yeah. where Robert, you know, he finally got nominated for it and, but he had cancer and you know, right. passing away, you know, it's a sad deal, but he knew that he was going in there. So it was, good and, and it was answer. great that Robert knew that he was voted into the hall of fame. You yeah. know, I mean, yeah. that was a wonderful thing. Uh, you know, the Yates family uh, again means so much to the business. Doug Yates is such a nice and wonderful person. I know he's been here yeah. with you yes. recently, I think he was. Yes. Um, and, and, and Robert and everyone and all the people that they touched and all the people that, uh, you know, uh, cross paths with them and, and they were a part of their life. I mean, it's, you know, it's a shame that both of those two great people are gone, but it's great that we had them here with us as long as we did absolutely didn't you know buddy at some I point did. Yeah. and if you think about the generation buddy benny uh, parsons ned jarrett yeah. that generation they were truly as well as advocates for the sport great drivers they were gentlemen mm -hmm. and they wanted to see progress and they wanted to see ways to help other people to lift up other people very positive yes in their commentary and what they said about each other and how they went about things and it was a true inspiration i was very fortunate when i started at wfmx that ned jarrett was um available benny they were available they were right like, you got questions mm -hmm. you want to know how do we keep this on the radio how do we keep qualifying on wfmx and you know we had a year when we weren't allowed where mrn actually stole oh wow qualifying yeah from 105.7 and i think one of the worst experiences ever in my sales career was when i had to tell don tilly at oh, Julie Hardy Davidson, that we didn't have qualifying anymore because MRN had taken it. Mm. And I mean, and then, you know, it eventually came back around because there was this whole just resurgence of people who said, no, 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 qualifying is important. We want it. We want it the way that we've always had it. And then, of course, you know, Benny ended up being the person who stepped in uh, after JD Benfield and did that program. And oh, wow. Because initially, Qualifying was only on WFMX mm -hmm. on 105.7 right here out of Statesville. I remember that. You know, That's so, really cool. Yeah, and which is, you know, Billy Buck, our owner, part of his heritage was, you know, uh, w, uh, WFMX. Uh, WFMX. Oh, that's so awesome. It was, it was interesting, but that was um, really, uh, truly wonderful that we had Benny, who was part of that all those years that we did that. Yeah, Benny, and, you know. Which led to Fast Talk and the different things he did with Doug and, you know, just sort of a um, local following people who were involved with sport on a very grassroots basis who just stepped up and took it as far as they could take it. You know, so, so Benny Parsons, um, as she mentioned, did the Fast Talk show Monday nights on mm -hmm. PRN. Uh, it was originally Fast Talk with Benny Parsons. And mm -hmm. when I was starting my Texas show back in 2005 mm -hmm. and we had come here and talked to Doug, needed to come up with some sort of a demo, you know. Uh, I mean, we didn't want to just do the show because we were trying to sell it to advertisers as well. So I asked Doug, you know, is there anything, you know, that she can do? Well, he knew Benny. About an hour later, I'm sitting in my hotel um, over there by, you know, UNC Charlotte, and Doug calls and says, hey, go over to Benny Parsons' house. You can interview him. <laughs> yeah. like, really? Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I literally, uh, at 1130 that morning, I went over to Benny Parsons' house, knocked on his door, and we sat and talked for probably 15, 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. Could not have been more gracious about everything that we talked about. I mean, it was actually a really great interview, you know, and, and just welcomed me in my home. You know, we did it. It was done and it was great and everything on down the road. But to your point, just the, the people are what really make this sport. Exactly. And, and the people in the sport are truly amazing. Mm -hmm. well, you find yourself whenever you, you're talking about sitting down interviewing someone, um, the, the more you do it, of course, the more you practice it, the more you, the better you get. Mm-hmm. The same with video. I know you have a video when you went to Daytona. I think it was yeah. 2017. I was looking on your YouTube channel, and um, and I saw you'd done a video. But is it different for you doing video versus audio? You know, like sometimes I can tell when I'm on the radio here with WAME, and then when I cut the Facebook off or whatever, it's a little bit different. It's like, mm -hmm. okay, now I can kind of relax a little bit more. 
But you know, the same with you. Yeah, kind of <laughs> yeah. like that. I find myself doing that a lot too. Yeah. So, so, so back then, I had this great yeah. idea that I was going to like, you know, kind of do like a travel YouTube thing, which I still kind of want to do. Yeah. But I'm thinking more like, you know, maybe just regular travel stuff. I, I go a lot of places on my motorcycle and all of that. Mm-hmm. But, um, and I love making videos. I really do. But man, it's a lot of work. Yeah. yeah. You know. I, I mean, it is. if you're yeah. focused That's, on that, you have yeah. to be kind of focused on that. And this is what's great about where social media has evolved. If you want to show some people some little short video snippets of something, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you can do that. But but I actually do enjoy like putting things together and, and yeah. producing all of that. But that Same Goodyear here. Blimp thing was so much fun. Um, I'd never done that before. I was going to ask you too. You got the uh, so I went and did similar. I did a, sort of the same thing. I have to send you the link. Uh, but I didn't get the Streamline Hotel, and you got that in your video. So I'm like, man, maybe I can borrow. Yeah, I was driving up and down A1A or whatever. Yeah. I have all that, by the way. Yeah, yeah. whatever you want. There's a hotel called the but, Streamline Hotel on A1A. Well, that's the one where the uh, where they signed the the, the NASCAR first NASCAR was, meeting. Yeah, yeah. or where Bill NASCAR France. was created, or essentially. Yeah, that's so right. Bill France Senior mentioned interviewing Benny. I forgot about Who that. are some of yep. your other favorite interviews? Oh wow, uh, you know it, it's interesting. Some t- it's. Um, there are favorite interview moments. I was telling someone this the other day. I remember um, Dale Jr., he was still with DEI mm-hmm. at the time, and, and he was my office was my studio at Texas, and it was right in the little square building that's out there by the lake, if you can visualize Texas at the time. And, and they had they were doing this like on Speed Channel, this NASCAR 360 show. I don't know if you guys remember that. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it was that show. It was one of those type shows. But there was like a few episodes where they're following Dale Jr. around, and this girl had caught Dale Jr.'s eye at Texas. And, you know, it gets on the show. And mind you, this show probably airs like six months after they after they right. filmed it or anything. Mm-hmm. And we're doing the interview. And at the very end of it, I asked him, I go, oh, man, whatever happened like to that? You know, you still dating that girl? <laughs> and, oh. and the look on his face oh, was like, he almost was like, why does the sheet? It, obviously, he was not at the time. <laughs> yes. but, but to his credit at the time, he, you know, he, I, I, I can't remember what brought it up in conversation, but he was like, yeah, you know, I, I would love to be married and have a family and settle down and have a kid. And, and I always think of that when you see Dale Jr. now that, you know, he's got his beautiful wife, Amy, now two children and, and all of that, which is great. But, but one of the more fun ones I did, and this was around that time, you know, you're always trying to think of something different to talk to someone about other than, you know, the, well, you got a top 10, you led 20 laps last week or whatever it might be. All right. So Jeff, <laughs> Jeff Gordon came in and I thought, you know, this man has accomplished so much. I wonder how much he knows about himself. Yes. So I, I did Jeff Gordon trivia. Okay. With Jeff Gordon. <laughs> That's good. Oh, it was it was awesome. I was like, you know, and, and this is, mind you, this is pre-Kyle Bush winning like, you know, almost 100 Xfinity like races. Yeah. yeah. So I was like, what 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 record do you hold in the Xfinity series? He's like, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. I said, you won eight poles in a year. Did I? Yeah. You know, I mean, it was like, I, I, if, if, if I had 10 questions yeah. for Jeff Gordon in Jeff Gordon trivia, he might have known like two things about himself. <laughs> That's great. I tried it with Matt yeah. Kenseth and Matt Kenseth knew everything. Yeah. And sure. then I told sure. him, I go, yeah. oh man, Jeff Gordon failed this. He goes, well, yeah. if I had done as much as Jeff Gordon, I probably would have forgotten a lot along exactly. the way too. Well, that's so, a good point. Yes. Exactly. It was uh, a nice compliment. So can I borrow that? I need to borrow that. Uh, please do. It, it, it was a world of fun. Yeah. I mean, it was awesome. I'd like to do that for some of my guests that I have in coming back in, you know, yeah. twice. So, yeah. Because I had Joey Knuckles in and I've had him mm-hmm. in, well, I had him on the phone before. So it's good to see him coming in. And I've had uh, Mike Hill who worked for Junior Johnson for many, many, many oh, years. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so I'd like to have him back, but I'm going to do that. I'm going to say, Mike, did you know this about yourself? Yeah. I might do that. So <laughs> what I was talking about, the uh, Streamline Hotel, the one thing I did get in my video that I didn't notice that you getting was where uh, Smoky Unix Garage was. Yeah. Because it burned down, of course. Mm-hmm. I was going to say, I, I, wouldn't, yeah. I wouldn't even know where it was. So I, what I did was I looked on old pictures of this, this big hotel there on the water. So I saw in the hotel, there's a fire, the garage on fire, and there's the water. So I just rode around all over the place. Didn't ask anybody anything. And I just kind of led to this one spot. It was a vacant lot and there was no sign or anything. Wow. And I was like, okay, I've seen a picture of him down by this river. It looks like it's right over there with his race car with one of them. And then there's the hotel in the background. So I just started looking around and sure enough, the, the next time and I did a little video and I said, I think this is where it was. So you'll have to find that on my YouTube. But the next That's time awesome. I went down, there was actually there. Somebody put a little sign there. Oh, in, that's in that cool. Same little spot. So I, I would look. Mm-hmm. Yes. You, you know what surprised me the most about that Goodyear blimp ride, by the way? What's that? So as we're going over the water, mm-hmm. and and this is you know this time of year essentially, but you know mm-hmm. there are some people already out on the beach and doing that. And, 
and you didn't look really too far out in the water, and you could see sharks swimming around. Oh, oh my God! I, I mean, it, it like but it, never realize it when you're out there, and yeah. you know, I mean, you're you're that close to them, and yeah. and you know, obviously they're doing their own thing, and you're doing your own thing. But mm -hmm. I I was truly shocked about how many sure. and how close they were. You know, they say if you are like ankle deep, you are close to a shark. Wow. Uh, yeah. Really? yeah. I mean, they're everywhere. So you yeah. stick yeah, Now if I ever there. touch a fish, you know, if I'm in the ocean, <laughs> oh, I'm literally going to visualize a shark and you'll see me run <laughs> on <laughs> water. Yes. I'm it's, sorry. I just ruined the beach. It's hard for me to get in water anymore that I can't I, see my I feet. I just ruined the beach for everyone. Yeah, you did. Yeah. Thank Ankle you deep. Yes. Yeah, they probably didn't want us yeah. telling that story because of that Absolutely. very same reason. But yeah. yeah, they're there. So Man. you stick your head out the blimp and yell shark. Let's watch everybody. You got to get this on video. Oh, it was crazy. Yeah. So we need uh, to say hello to R.D. Ford. Yes, in uh, New Hampshire. Yes, and Rachel also has, Rachel has the best question. Yes. Oh, good. Okay. She's down what in Charlotte. So Rachel's in Charlotte. She volunteers with the uh, NASCAR Hall of Fame a lot of times, right. yes. And so Rachel's question is, who is someone Brad would like to see recognized in the NASCAR Hall of Fame who is not yet inducted? Jeff Hammond. Oh, uh, that, yeah, that's an easy I, answer absolutely. for me. Okay. Yeah. Um, wow, that was quick. It, it's it's and and I say that because I work with Jeff mm -hmm. and I know Jeff and he's a really great guy. But I mean, if any driver uh, of Jeff's age mm -hmm. and not yeah. even of Jeff's age, how, half Jeff's how age, old is yeah. Jeff now? Uh, would you say? I, I don't know. Um, I, I just turned fifty a week ago, um, and uh, yeah, Jeff's a little older than me. <laughs> I, I did too. Um, I'm thinking he's he's about ten years older than me. Yeah, so. somewhere somewhere on there. Hey, yeah. He's not as old as. But think about this: if any driver had forty three career wins and two championships. They would absolutely be in the Hall of Fame. I know. And you look at Jeff Hammond, you look at Kirk Shelmerdine, you look at Andy Petrie. I, I personally feel that the Hall of Fame is way underserved for crew chiefs. For crew chiefs. I agree. Absolutely. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, they are such a huge part of the history. Mm -hmm. and, and there are crew chiefs in there. Don't get me wrong. I mean, you know, Ray Everham and, and a lot yeah. of people are very deserving of their Hall of Fame nod. But... I just, you know, we pretty much got most of the driver champions who are eligible in the Hall of Fame. There are mm -hmm. a ton of crew chief champions who mm -hmm. have never even been nominated. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. That's I, true. I've thought about before talking to them, because I have like probably 10 fire suits and they're in, in the boxes mm -hmm. or in drawers in my house. And I'm like, you know, could they have a display, let's say, for crew members? Oh, yeah. You know, do that type of thing. Mm -hmm. Or so, could you just um, have a Halloween party at your house? And well, you could. That's, that's or you could just that wear them usually. to work on Monday nights. Yeah, I, I know. Uh, <laughs> my, and I Sometimes you that. just got to wear the Novak. Larry Mack can still fit into his, like, old Quaker State uniforms oh, and Texaco oh, Haviland. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I can totally I see that, that picture. being, like, a goal for him, too. Uh, absolutely, yeah, because he still does work for Quaker State, and we were down in Kentucky a couple of years ago, and, and he and I did a uh, show together for about a year, and, and he shows up, <laughs> and he is wearing his Quaker State uniform like uh, from back in the Ricky Rudd days. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, so Jeff Hammond was my first interview in NASCAR. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Back around 19, it was 94, I believe, so early in the 94 season, mm -hmm. or late 93, somewhere in that area. So I went over to the, he was with Kenny Wallace, the Dirt Devil car, the 40 car back then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was a Sabco car. And I got to mm -hmm. be friends with the Sabco guys. I went to college at Central Piedmont in Charlotte. And oh, grew, cool. Grew up a big race fan all my life. And so I went, I got an interview with Jeff Hammond. And so I went over there and I sat out in the lobby and Michelle Fesperman was the uh, secretary. So she kept going and checking on him, whatever. So two hours later, <laughs> I get in to see uh, Jeff. And I've told him this story. Actually, I ran into him up at Indianapolis one time. And I said, hey, oh, did you? I said, hey, Jeff, you remember me? I said, now I'm a jack man, you know, for Cal Petty, I think, at the time or something. Right. <laughs> so, uh, but, yeah, I sat there for two hours. And he's like, you sure are persistent, aren't you? And I said, yes. I said, I want to get a job in racing. And it was to do, like, electrical stuff or whatever. But I ended up getting a letter. I didn't get the job. But I did end up getting the job over at Sabco down in Charlotte. Uh, Very you know, cool. Because that was up in Concord. So, yeah, I mean, everything happens for a reason. Yeah. Uh, but since then, I've actually been over to Jeff's house. And, uh, you know, he does a lot of the uh, roping and the, the mm -hmm. cattle stuff and all that. The horses, loves his horses and all that. So, yeah. So, uh, basically, like I said earlier, he's sort of like my neighbor out there. Yeah, yeah. That's mm -hmm. uh, I can see that. So you work with him though on a regular basis, right? Every I, I do. Or so, okay. Yeah. So, what? What are you gonna say? No, I what? just I'm listening to you talk about being persistent, and yeah. I think about your guest a couple of mm -hmm. weeks ago. Mm -hmm. 
the Amish guy, Marshall. Oh, uh, oh Mar- 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 Marlon Troyer. That Marlon. is one of the best shows that, that the, you have one of done. The best yes. shows oh my yeah. gosh, it's oh, wow. amazing. I'll yeah. check that out. So this kid, I, I guess he was so determined. Oh yeah, that he, he was. was. Do it. He left the Amish community. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I remember. I think I, I think like Speed or someone or Race Hub did a story on him about four or five years ago. Mm-hmm. Maybe. Oh, I think I, maybe. I, yeah, I think I know who you're talking about. You worked for I, Jimmy Johnson now. Yeah, I definitely yeah. want to go watch that. That's it really was cool. an amazing, yeah. it was a amazing great show. show. But I yeah, think it's... about Brad and his like transition through mm-hmm. everything from like all the radio to this. I mean, mm-hmm. was it something you felt like you had to really stick with, or was it? a natural transition to get here it, or it, it was uh, honestly um it was a couple things i mean i was fortunate that they built texas motor speedway mm-hmm. right down the road from where i lived yeah um but once they did you know that that's something that you know i, I pursued you know I, I went after i mean i loved loved racing i i used to have a, uh, one of my buddies in college my roommate he played on the baseball team he had actually gone to high school with me, and, and we would sit there, um, like having lunch in the cafeteria, um, debating on whether or not NASCAR drivers were athletes and all of those things. And, and he's a baseball player, you know, and, and all of this. And, and it was funny. I mean, we, would just, we could literally do this for days after day after day after mm-hmm. day. And they had run an ASA race or an ARCA race or something out at Texas World Speedway. And I had been to one there a few years prior that actually Bobby Allison had run in, which was really cool. Mm-hmm. So the radio station where I worked, it was a Thunder 101.7 country station. Um, we were giving away tickets, and I asked my boss, I was like, can I, can I have a pair of these? So I brought my buddy Mike out there, and, and he was blown away. And we were in the infield. And, and, you know, like when you're in the infield of the racetrack, the cars don't even look as fast as what they do when you're outside of the fence. It's just, mm-hmm. you know, the yeah. way you're turning in that circle as opposed to being on the outside of the circle. It, they just don't. He was blown away. I mean, he he could not get enough of it. And then the people in the infield. I mean, we drove in, and literally there is a stereotypical chili cook-off happening oh, yeah. right there with the guy who had chili in his beard. And, you know, when we're watching, the, and he was like, I had no idea these cars are this fast. And, yeah. you know, all of these things. And it was a great mm-hmm. moment. And I think anyone in racing has probably had that moment where they've taken someone who didn't understand it to the racetrack, and all of a sudden mm-hmm. that person was like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe this. I saw this and this and that. So Absolutely. That's what I've noticed about people whenever they say, oh, I don't watch NASCAR. I don't I've never and I've like have you ever been to a race no yeah. I haven't been yeah I'm like well there you go that's, that's when why you have to go. yeah that's you get hooked on it you get hooked on the smell the uh the the all the, the senses everything all the senses mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah well let's put you on the spot all right who are your top three drivers Ooh, top oh. three you know here's what's <laughs> here's what's bad and I'll be 100% honest with yeah. you I don't really care who wins a race yes um I just want to see a good race yes you know I mean that that's it plain and simple and and I would say my top three drivers sort of vary. Now, now on the air, we talk about this all the time. I'm an Eric Jones fan. Yes. Uh, and I have no shame there. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, the first time he came on Sirius XM mm-hmm. was with Buddy and I. Mm-hmm. And he had not yet won his first race, but yes. he had already beaten Kyle Busch at the Snowball Derby to get yep. that job. You know, a couple months later, he won that first truck series race at 16 years old yes. at Phoenix. Mm-hmm. And I've just always really liked and respected him, but why, it was because of watching him on the racetrack. I mean, here's you know, uh, you know, a, a kid that's you know barely old enough to you know vote, even drive. Yeah, and and here he is racing against Kyle Busch and and you know the the best right. of the best, totally unintimidated by any one of them, and 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 going out there and beating him. I mean, mm-hmm. he wasn't even a full time Xfinity driver, and he mm-hmm. won his first yeah. Xfinity race out at Texas, yes. yeah. and you know everything. So I, I I do I genuinely like. Eric mm-hmm. Jones, I think he's a really good guy. I mean, I always like Jimmy Johnson because of oh, yeah. because of Jimmy Johnson. Yeah. Um, you know, in part because of what he did on the racetrack. Because if you really watched him, he was relentless as a driver, but he didn't wreck anyone to do it. You know, I, I can remember a couple of times just watching him just go after someone, go after someone, fight, 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 till he finally got a win, you know, you know, would beat them in a given race. And, and sometimes people didn't recognize that. And, and it's hard to say because um, – you know, sometimes you talk to people and, you know, you're like the 15th person that's talked to them that day mm-hmm. and they're just disinterested in the conversation, but they're nice. Yeah. You know, sometimes you talk to people and they're just always just, you know, simply really good and mm-hmm. engaging people. So I don't dislike anybody, but I don't know that I like anyone more than anybody mm-hmm. else, if that makes sense. And I, I really mm-hmm. don't want that to be like like a cop out yeah. answer. Like I love talking to Kyle Busch mm-hmm. about the racing and the race car because no one. No one can describe moments or things that happen on the racetrack 
in more detail and in a better way than Kyle Busch. That's true. I mean, and, and I think that's part of what makes him so good at what he does is because he can provide that feedback. Um, you know, it's Chase Elliott. We're standing behind the stage, you know, before we're going to go on the air during a PRN broadcast. And we're just, you know, kind of, you know, talking back and forth he's a really great guy we go and sit down and like hey here's a planned interview you know and 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 chase couldn't be more disinterested in something like that and that's not a knock on him right. but it's like you know the chase elliott just hanging out and talking to is a great guy the chase elliott who's got to answer questions about him and what he does is something that he's just not you know always mm. have been comfortable with mm. so you know like i like this chase elliott and then this chase elliott i'm like i gotta get something out of him for what i do for my job you know well so. have you found with talking to brad koslowski that you need to talk about technical things more with him because he's very analytical he is very. and technical mm-hmm. Uh, that's been my experience with Brad. Yeah, yeah. Brad, Brad's not a huge fan of sitting down for interviews, um, mm-hmm. and I think he would tell you that. I'm, I'm not, you know, being rude in any way, shape, or form. Um, we were talking to him the other week, and and I, I do think Brad is a person who appreciates if you put some thought into what you're doing. Um, you know, Ryan Newman's the same way, but we were talking to Brad about. Um, his future past NASCAR and I'm never trying to retire any drivers, you know, early or anything, but you know, I brought up the fact that he's got a rapid prototyping business and we were talking Mm -hmm. about electric cars and all of a sudden these are things that aren't the same 50 questions that he's already gotten Mm -hmm. about, you know, Hey, you made it to the championship four last year and the, this and the, that, you know, sometimes he's disinterested in those things, but he has a various amount of interest in a lot of things, Mm -hmm. or he is very, You know, if you ask him big picture questions about the sport, he likes to talk about Mm -hmm. those things as well because Mm -hmm. he he has his his opinions that are well thought out. Maybe not everyone agrees with them, but they're well thought out by him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's really important because I think sometimes people don't recognize the breadth of information Mm -hmm. that you can receive from these people who are involved in the sport and how how deeply they think about the you know the different aspects of what they're doing. Yeah. And I will say this, um and Kevin Harvick is yes. someone who, yeah. uh, and, and I always haven't been like a fan of personally engaging with mm-hmm. Kevin Harvick, but mm-hmm. last year when COVID hit, uh, he had done a show for Sirius XM for a couple of years, just a, an hour long show on Wednesday, the happy hours that he did with Matt Yoakum. Well, when COVID hit, thing, Kevin Harvick reached out to, uh, you know, my Sirius XM boss, Daniel Norwood, and said, we're not doing anything else. Why don't we bring happy hours back? You know, and and reached out and did that. And he would come into PRN, he and Matt Yoakum, once a week Mm -hmm. um, and do the show. And I would be there, you know, producing it from a technical side of things. And um, I've always liked Kevin Harvick. I've always admired him. But here is a guy who, when you talk about the most complete person in racing, Mm -hmm. as far as being a driver and and knowing what he wants, as far as being a personality in the sport and and being able to know what he wants Mm -hmm. and and really kind of control every aspect of who he is, but in a really good and positive way, um, that's him. But but he is someone else who wants to give back. You know, he if 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 it's worthwhile for the sport or something, he will absolutely give his time anytime. And um, I really grew a new admiration and respect for him last year after that time. I was talking to Rodney Childers one time, and he was saying how, of course, that's his driver. But Mm -hmm. uh, we we were talking about how things seemed like they changed whenever Earnhardt passed away. Because Earnhardt was kind of like the, you know, if if NASCAR had a question or let's say uh, there's something going on, Earnhardt would go to the trailer and to the NASCAR hauler, and they would talk about it. And they would come up with an answer, you know. Mm-hmm. And I said, who would, who could replace him? Who do you think could replace him? And he said he thinks Harvick would be the man yeah. for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he, he really is. I mean, he knows how to look at the big picture. And, and I started noticing that. Um, Harvick drove for Dale Jr. Uh, on the Xfinity yeah. side. When, when he first went to Stuart Haas and they were Chevrolet, he drove for Dale Jr. And someone had asked Dale Jr., um, and I think Harvick may have won a race at Atlanta. Um, and someone had asked Dale Jr. about having Harvick drive, and he said, you know, what you get with Kevin Harvick is not just an immensely talented driver, but a guy who can make things happen. Mm-hmm. If there's something not right with the car, he knows who to call. If there are resources needed outside of the race mm-hmm. shop with Chevrolet, with the man, he knows who to call. And not only does he know who to call, he knows how to make things happen. Exactly. And, and when I heard that, I started noticing that mm-hmm. about Kevin. And, and that's where, again, it comes to the how, how much of a, a complete racer that he is in all facets of what he does. Mm-hmm. And, and it's pretty admirable to watch him. Exactly. Yeah. So we have a really good question. But <laughs> before I 
say what the question is. I just want to preface it with this because I think we all know that this is the 20th anniversary mm -hmm. of Dale's death. Yes. Mm -hmm. And to your point, Brad, there was an excellent editorial in the Observer, Charlotte Observer today about Dale Earnhardt and how just what you guys were saying, how like when Dale said saw something that was wrong, he would just march himself up into the and NASCAR say, trailer. Yeah, and like yeah. he, he was he him. was the leader of the garage. Right. If you and, will. They and they talked about Harvick, too. And then they actually referenced Brian Newman's crash last mm -hmm. year. And, you know, mm -hmm. he lives here in Statesville. So it was just it was not fake news. It was a really great piece and the observer if you haven't read it today mm -hmm. you really should because oh wow it's yeah. a very great testimony to dale and to all the other people mm -hmm. who like have carried on including mm -hmm. ryan and some great quotes from ryan so i missed that yeah i said that last week that whenever earnhardt when we always knew whenever the race was called because he would be in his regular clothes because he was already gone <laughs> yeah that too we saw him in martinsville yeah. you know you couldn't cross the track or anything i mean right. it's like uh, he was standing over there ready to go, and we're, like, standing there. Mm -hmm. Our pit box hadn't been put up or anything. We're like, well, the race is called. He's gone. <laughs> yes. Yeah, he knows something. What was the question? So uh, the question is, what is it like to broadcast when a crash happens and it's unclear how it happened, and if the drivers are okay, how do you speak when fans mm -hmm. are holding their breaths? Mm -hmm. So so I, I, very real experience from Ryan Newman's crash last year. Um, I was on the air on Sirius XM. We were doing the post-race show. Mm -hmm. And I had mentioned at Texas for a year of when I was working there, I had managed the fire and EMS department. So I have a pretty good understanding of the work that they do and what they do and, and things that you see um, in what they're doing. And we all didn't know anything about Ryan Newman. I mean, look, anytime they put up a curtain oh, yeah. to block something yeah. from the crowd, you, know. you can't help but pause, you know. Right. And anytime they start to bring out the rescue tools, you know, be it the jaws of life or the mm -hmm. spreaders or anything like that, it, it really gives you reason to pause. And the tough thing about that night is, number one, you never want to make assumptions on anything because uh, because you don't know right. you know all you can do is go with the information that you know and we didn't know a whole lot of information and, and i can't remember exact details but there were little bitty things along the way that sort of were giving me a little bit of hope but the hardest thing and, and i mean the hardest thing was just the gravity of the situation obviously mm -hmm. but what i wanted to make sure that i did not do in that situation because it was really easy to want to do this mm -hmm. To start saying a bunch of really neat things about Ryan Newman and his accomplishments right. and, you right. know, hey, he's a former Daytona 500. Because then I thought, I don't want to make it sound like I'm eulogizing, eulogizing. Right. Exactly. you know, and, yeah. and, and so you're just trying to be very um, just kind of flat and constant with here's what we know. Mm -hmm. Here's what we don't know. You know, here's the situation. We know that Ryan has gone over to Halifax. We know that he's been out of the car. And then as you start to get the information, you start to hear little things, as, mm -hmm. as you well know. I mean, the rumor mill starts running, but, but none of those things matter until someone official says, Ryan Newman was alert. Yeah. Ryan Newman was breathing. Ryan Newman, you know, you, 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 you can't, even though you might hear some things, you can't say that. And, and I, I heard every end of the spectrum, by the way, behind the scenes from sure. people who were texting, who were making those assumptions. Yes. And, and you, it, it's yes. just such a wrong thing to do. So um, once we got through that night and we knew that the worst had not happened to Ryan Newman, um, you know, I, I left feeling really good about that number one and and i do feel like we as a group did a great job of covering that that story and just yes. you know you know not not making assumptions not mm -hmm. being alarming not eulogizing a man who didn't need to be or any of those things and uh it was an interesting night it was a tough night and, and obviously in the end the best thing happened and that was that he walked out of the hospital mm -hmm. two days later with his daughters yeah absolutely, absolutely. when i saw that it was no, just was like wow yeah amazing um, but I'm sure that's something you don't really sit down and say, hey, let's practice today on if yeah, something happens to a driver. Right? Right? And I think we all have to agree that losing Dale was the end of an era. Absolutely. In so many ways. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for me personally, it was a long time before I even watched the races again. Oh, wow. Yeah. I heard people like, say that. I, I've heard people, people say. Yeah. I mean, because he was just um, bigger than life, but just as down to earth as anybody you'd ever know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he was faces of sport. 
he w- without was. you know absolutely. And I'll say that I mean Jeff Gordon was the face of the sport at the time too, <laughs> yeah. but but he was. I mean, Dale was reluctantly the face of the yeah. sport sometimes, and you know just depended, but um, just you know such a an iconic figure mm-hmm. in racing, and really for a lot of people, I think that was kind of like I'm done. Yeah, and it's taken a lot, you know, to start to build that back up and see other people come in and do well, and mm-hmm. people who have stayed with it. But it truly, I have to say that watch, you know, watching the race that year, it was like this can't be happening. Yeah, it, it was tough. Happen, but know. but but amazingly, some of the most incredible storylines also came mm-hmm. out of that year. Um, in that the very next week, yes. you know. Steve Park goes and wins at, at Rockingham, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. driving yeah. Dale Earnhardt's yes. number one mm-hmm. car. That's true. And, you know, Dale Jr. wrecked early in that race. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, you're sitting there watching it thinking, how can he even race? I mean, exactly. how how, yeah. how hard does it have yeah. to be? Then we go back to Daytona in July, and, and there's Dale Jr. winning the race mm-hmm. with that, that Major League Baseball all-star game paint mm-hmm. scheme. You remember mm-hmm. it looked like a, a stitched yeah. baseball, yeah. the race car did, yeah. um, that Budweiser car. And... You know, I mean, that was one of those things that I think if if you felt as strongly mm-hmm. like you did, um, a lot of people did that yeah. that happens and you say, OK, it, it's going it, to be OK. Yeah. The sport's going to yeah. go on. Well, my part of it was I was, uh, of course, the first thing I did was cry whenever, you know, he, oh, he yeah. died. Yeah. And I, I was there the day before. But that was my year that I was on my uh, whatever. Uh, the season that I was <laughs> doing, whatever. yeah, so Fanatical. I was so I, yeah. whatever season. Well, I was yeah. basically. Um, I was on. I went to the Bush Series, and I said, "All right, I'm going to be a Jackman in the Bush Series for this year," and and so I ended up doing some Cup stuff too. But uh, I wasn't there that day. But but I also felt like when I went back to the track, it was kind of like, "All right, I'm here with my friends. These are mm-hmm. like my family. You know, yeah. NASCAR is like a big family." And I know you feel that too with your. Um, any t- you're around all the guys all the time, every weekend, whatever, and uh, even the drivers, the crews, and all that. You see each other every weekend. If something happens in the sport. You feel like you kind of like bond together. You're no longer, uh, you know, against each other in competition in that way. That's yeah. the most amazing yeah. thing about racers, mm-hmm. and, and 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 at any level. I yeah. mean, when when I was doing the Legends program at Texas, mm-hmm. I mean, look, I'm gonna be 100 percent honest with you. There were times where I, I dreaded going to the racetrack because what angry parent is gonna yell at me tonight mm-hmm. for something that I didn't even do? Right. I wasn't even holding the steering wheel. But yeah. you know, I mean, you know, but but these people would get mad at each other. They would compete with each other, and all of this. If someone's race car broke and they were trying to fix it to make the feature, mm-hmm. all of those people would just be huddled in, right. working with each other, mm-hmm. helping each other out, and and in even more dire situations like that. That that's, that is what it is. I mean, this you yeah. go back and you hang out with your family. Yeah, that's right. And I went through that with, uh, gosh, whenever I see uh, Blaze Alexander was a good uh, friend of mine. Blaze. Right. Yeah. Right. When he died right here, at Charlotte, and that was my uh, Jimmy Johnson connection with him and, mm-hmm. and Jarrett Johnson and and uh, Ricky Hendricks. Was yeah. another one that used to we used to hang out together, and then you know he died, and then the other one was, was um, Adam Petty, mm-hmm. yeah, because I was a Jackman for his dad, and he would come and sit on pit wall. I saw him almost every weekend, mm-hmm. you know, and he'd say, "So how did you like being a Jackman? Uh, how did you get to doing this?" And so he was interviewing me, and I'm like, "Well, how's that feel to be the king's grandson?" You know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just such a humble kid. Yeah, yeah. I, think it's, yeah. But, I think it's really hard for people who don't live in this part of the country, especially to understand how accessible Mm -hmm. these NASCAR people can be. Sometimes I have Mm -hmm. a friend who lives in Tucson named Lee Smith, who is Mm -hmm. always just completely idolized Dale senior and Dale Mm junior. And I'm like, well, you know, that's only like, yeah, 15 miles from my house. I mean, Mm -hmm. I don't think people, in the rest yeah. of the world understand that we see these people. I remember Michael Waltrip used to come out and hang out in a bar in Statesville, like back in the early nineties. I mean, it was you fun. just see people, you see NASCAR people mm-hmm. around here. Around. Yeah. I was yeah. watching the, the rain delay coverage in between the dual races um, because it rained before the second duel. And they were showing a, a great um, documentary about the making of days of thunder and a lot uh, of the things yes. that were happening. Mm-hmm. And at one point they're talking about, yeah, so Tom Cruise and Rick Hendrick and I think Jeff Gordon are, you know, having dinner at the Olive Garden, you know, <laughs> yeah. and I'm thinking, what would that have been like? But but realistically, they're just normal people, you know. I mean, every, some people we actually watch drive race cars and some people we watch on the big screen and, yeah. you know, some people we, you know, I- I exchange money with when we're mm-hmm. buying a T-shirt. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's everyone is just a person mm-hmm. and, and ultimately they are too, so. Yeah, my I uncle think- drove the, uh, the limo for him, for uh, Tom Cruise. 
whenever he was doing that movie here Did in Charlotte. Did they go to the sandwich construction company? Maybe. I don't know. It <laughs> has was, to be like the place. I was there when, when Kyle did his first bike ride and he yeah. come back because I was working over there then. But it's like if we go to Hollywood or somewhere out in California, we're we're starting <laughs> to look around for, you know, whoever, Tom Cruise or something. You know, well, we see him, it's like, wow. Yeah, and the cool but, thing, I've seen Tom Cruise at the racetrack a couple of times. I've seen him here out of Charlotte. I've seen him at Richmond, you know, and he's not going there because he's the Grand Marshal or he's the anything like that. He just want to go to race. You know, I mean, and it's, he went to Richmond. Yeah, yeah well, well, <laughs> and that and that was one of the shocker shocker things for me when I got into NASCAR. You know, I was so starstruck from the time I can remember being a David uh, David Pearson fan. You know, at five or six, seven years mm -hmm. old, whatever, and Kelly Yarbrough. And then when I got into racing, I'm like, at the track, here I am. And there's everybody around. You know, yeah. there's Junior Johnson All right the there. They're smoking yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, it's just like, you know. So, but you get used to it after over time. Yeah. You just told me I had to be cool. <laughs> The first time I ever went to the pits and with my yeah, team, they were like, Don, you just cool. have to be cool. Yeah. Yeah. Just act like you belong That's here. Right. Just don't yeah, but you know what? It, it, it's it's the, the rabid, passionate fan base of this sport, too, that really makes this sport. I mean, it's, it you is. know, it, it's great that 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 there are a, a lot of people who, you know, you know I, I've run past Kyle Busch in the back hallway at Charlotte Motor Speedway, and we just walked past each other and mm -hmm. didn't say a word, you know. But it's great to think that, you know, someone, if they did that, would literally stop down, and that would be the story that they told their grandkids, right. you know, 40 years from now. I mean, that's oh, yeah. that, that's what's awesome about this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, um, it, it's such a fun thing, a fun sport to be a part of the last race i took my parents to and then they said okay that's it we don't have to go to any more because i took them to rockingham to a bunch of different places but whenever michael walter won the all-star race at charlotte yeah mm -hmm. and we got on the elevator to go up to felix abadis's suite and mm -hmm. up there beside richard petty's mm -hmm. so we we're on the elevator and michael walter's in there with us yeah so my dad's just like hey michael walter you know he was a huge <laughs> Darrell walter fan and michael and so we get up there and my mom's sitting over there at the table at felix is over in his suite and then he's uh, the king walks up and starts rubbing her shoulders, you know. So she turns around and oh. it's Richard Petty rubbing her on her shoulders. Yeah. So they're both that made their, they're like, okay. All right. So this okay. is a great story. Uh, th this ties in a few things we talked about. So Doug Rice, uh, president of PRN, mm -hmm. always a huge Richard Petty fan. Yes. You know, he, he literally still has like a little Playmate cooler <laughs> that has a sticker on it that I, I, I want to say it says like either six time champion or five time champion, six time Daytona 500 winner, whatever, whatever it was. Yeah. Um, it, but it's, you know, it's not like the end stats for Richard right. Petty. Right. So <laughs> I remember we had Buddy and I had him on one night, mm -hmm. and Doug was telling the stories like, I remember I was at Martinsville Speedway one time. You know, I mean, look, you go to Martinsville Speedway, if you're a Richard Petty fan, you're probably going to have a good day. Yeah. <laughs> this was literally the one short track win that Buddy Baker ever earned in his career, oh, and wow. he beat Richard Petty. Yeah. Um, you know, so Doug talked about that, which is a funny thing. So fast forward a few years ago um a, a group of folks put together uh, a nascar cruise mm -hmm. and you know there are a bunch of nascar personalities on there a handful of drivers people like david reagan were on there jeff hammond was on there um it's actually where i really got to know no jeff hammond because he was in a cabin next to mine richard petty was on there um you know uh, the, the donnie allison was on there bobby uh, just so many people dale jr made an appearance at the key west stop and it was all that but it happened to be around my birthday and this still makes I, i'll remind doug of this quite often mm -hmm. um one of the ladies who had organized the whole cruise um we were doing a q a and there was a lot of those like you know hey here at seven o'clock you know richard petty and rusty wallace are going to be here we're doing a q a mm -hmm. she got richard petty to sing me happy birthday uh -huh. oh, oh, my and God. It, was, it was i mean look it, it was one That's of the most awesome. amazing things and and jeff hammond and i were actually with richard literally last week on my birthday again mm -hmm. doing an interview with them yeah. for our Sirius XM show but yeah I, that's one of those that you just don't ever forget you think God, here's this larger than life guy um, which he is still I mean you oh, walk absolutely. in the room with Richard Petty yeah. and he commands the room mm -hmm. yeah. and um, that was a cool thing but yeah I'll always remind Doug of that it's always amazing every time I see Richard Petty even on TV or whatever I mean he always looks so good it's yeah. just like he's got his stature you know he's standing up straight yeah um, and last time I saw him in person was I went out to a Victory Junction game, mm -hmm. and uh, Kyle asked me to come out one night. They were having NASCAR night. It was uh, Rodney Childers was there. He was oh, coming cool. out too. And so I went out, and uh, I rode through Randleman. There's a little statue there, Richard Petty. 
but it's I yeah. say little because it's a little statue. <laughs> it's definitely <laughs> not. Short. Yeah. So I took a picture of it and as yeah. soon as I got there and I showed it to to the king and then and then he's like he kinda laughed a little bit, you know, and he's like, Yeah, that's pretty cool, and you know and I showed it to Kyle and Kyle just starts cracking up <laughs> laughing. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, We're gonna if we're gonna redo that statue, you know we're gonna redo you know how Kyle is he's always hype up. Yeah. We're gonna they're gonna redo that statue. We're gonna you know, it's it's not tall enough and it's not enough. So I was like, oh, sorry. <laughs> See, we've been trying to get like, Kyle to come in and play yeah. music with us. I know. Okay, yeah. So, yeah. so a few years ago. Yeah. Uh, like, I love Kyle's stories. We used to do a deal at Texas um, on, like, the Wednesday or Thursday night of race week. Um, called it Fandango. And, you know, it was more of an irreverent night that, um, you know, the, the drivers were – their guard was down. Kyle Petty, Michael Waltrip would host it and all of that. And Kyle would always write a song <laughs> for, for the deal. And it was a funny kind of parody song. But apparently Kyle writes a lot of his songs riding his motorcycle, mm -hmm. like with a grease pencil writing <laughs> the lyrics on his gas tank or with the Sharpie. Yeah. Um, but People he was still use grease pencils. Well, yeah, I guess if that's what you do, that's what you do. Um, <laughs> But we went to, we were in Bristol, and in Johnson City, Kyle Petty was doing a, a concert at, a, you know, just a little uh, bar there. Mm -hmm. And a bunch of us from PRN went. And 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 Kyle, he, he prefaced it before the show. He's like, look, you know, I write a lot of songs, and some of my songs are a little depressing. You listen to the words of Kyle Petty's songs? <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, you know, like, I mean... Awesome. They, they, they are, and I, would, I don't know that I'd call. I guess it's country music, but they are these stereotypical. You know, my yeah. wife left me and kicked the dog on the way out while my truck <laughs> engine blew and had a flat. But I mean, it's like, yeah. you know. But now I think that he's a dad again, and all of these things. Um, you know, his uh, or a new dad again, I should say. Um, I think some of his songs have lightened up a little bit, but he's very mm -hmm. entertaining. The first time I met him was, um, I say, the first time I was in. I was in a workout room at Sabco back in Charlotte, mm -hmm. and he had. Uh, he was telling me about his recordings, like he'd been in a studio and was doing some singing. And I said, I don't think I can do that. You know, I, I would like to sing. He's like, anybody can sing when you get in the studio. So, you know, and then, but he gives me his cassette tape. And, and I remember listening to that song, Old King Richard, all, yeah. uh, over and yeah. over and over. It's a great song yeah. to his dad. Yeah. And I still have that tape somewhere. But cool. I would um, say you say anybody can sing when they get in the studio. I mean, you guys have heard the old NASCAR album where like Buddy Baker and oh, Bill yeah. Elliott yes. and, you know. Yes. <laughs> so it's not exactly Maybe not true. anybody. Maybe not. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so, it's very true. Uh, David, I yeah. just have to mention this because yeah. it's been a question of mine for mm -hmm. the last several months since I haven't been in the studio. So when I watch it from home on my – you can watch David on your big like, big on a big TV, isn't it yeah. great? Smart yeah. TV. I love it's having a YouTube awesome. app. Yeah, which is yeah. why I haven't actually been in the studio because I can just you can do it from home have to. and watch it. Right. But I see that the Jersey Capes yachts yeah. that we should call out, right? Yeah, yeah, Jersey Cape yachts. It's in my intro as well. But yes, uh, Jersey Cape yachts is my sponsor. We should thank and them. The, and yeah, they do custom yachts. They do anywhere from uh, thirty-one feet to uh, sixty-one feet. I keep looking. 66 feet. I, I'm looking That's in your thing, idea. and I'm like, it's not above it's my not head, so yes. it must yeah. not really exist yes. in real life. Yeah, thanks for that. They are in uh, 2143 River Road in Lower Bank, New Jersey, 08216. And that you can email Janine at Janine at jerseycapeyachts.com or call her at 609-965-8650, and they have apparel like I have this shirt on. Mm. I like I it. Need a yeah, sure. so I got the we long need. Yeah. Can you test drive one for the weekend? That's, that's, that's here. I know, fun. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they're actually, you know, the custom yachts. So they're, I'm sure they're very cool. Not really cheap, but they're custom. And I just we can to put make those sure you Norman have the shout out as well. Yes, thank you. I could you. like see it over my head on my iPad. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah. I can't yeah. yeah. And, and let me say, when when you're looking for a 31 to 66 foot yacht, you're not looking for the cheap yacht. You're looking for the well made yacht. Yes. Right. That's true. Yes. My brother. You get what you pay for. You yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so you do know Claire B. Lang. Uh, she oh, used to call Claire. me. Uh, yeah, she used to say Jack Man every time I saw her. Yeah. Uh, but she was seemed like she was everywhere back back she in the nineties and. She moves know. around a lot. That's yeah. for sure. Is she still? Is she with you? Yeah, now? she she and I do the pre and post trade shows together. Um, I have to start listening. Yeah, 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 and uh, you know, uh, it, it's been tough for Claire because that's you know her world is moving around the garage and talking to people and and really developing those relationships mm -hmm. and meeting with people. And because of COVID and the situation yeah. that we're in, mm -hmm. um, it, she just can't right. go. Um, but uh, you know, it, it's great when we do our post race shows and we get the you know the winning drivers, the top finishers, the crew chiefs and all of that calling in and all of that. It, it's a lot of fun. But yeah, she's been around the sport for a long, long time. It's developed a lot of relationships along the way. Yeah. Did she start out 
with John Boy and Billy, like I a believe so. Long time ago. Yeah, as I understand it, she worked with them for quite some time. I used to commute to Charlotte in like 1995, and they would have they would bring her into the studio periodically, and I thought she was hilarious. <laughs> and then when I went to the racetrack in like 97. She was everywhere, like, doing interviews with people. Wow. So. Well, it was one of those things, too. It was like, uh, you're not from around here. Right. <laughs> because she's, exactly. No, she's from yeah. Wisconsin. Yeah, she yeah. definitely was. And her Wisconsin. husband, Mike, mm-hmm. is the nicest person you will ever meet. He is just an awesome guy. Doesn't he really fly planes? Guy. No, he was a longshoreman. Um, oh. Yeah, so okay. I don't I don't think he flies planes. No, he plays something. a lot of golf now. Okay, yeah. So, but, yeah, <laughs> he was something different. He's a wonderful guy. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, if Brad could choose any sport he wanted to um, on a top race team with the talent he needed, what position would you choose if you could choose any spot? Like if you were a jackman, tire changer, I'm assuming, crew chief, whatever, <laughs> yeah. that kind of stuff on a top team, what would you want to do? You know what I like to do, actually? And, and, and this is always a moving target, you know. I mean, out, outside of driving the race car, which would be pretty awesome, yeah. I'd like to be a spotter. Okay. They get to watch the race. Yeah, they do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, let's, you know, let's be honest, yeah. you know. And, and and the spotter position has truly evolved into being really one of the key positions. I mean, mm-hmm. you don't really hear, you know, to your inside, to your outside, clear. Um, you hear that, but you also hear, you know, hey, so-and-so's running this line and they're making up time. And you hear them on the second channel talking to the mm-hmm. crew chief. Looks like, uh, you know, has really big struggles getting into turn three, starts drifting up in the middle of the corner. I mean, it, it's it's – they become – way more of an uh, integral part of the team but yeah I'd, I'd probably want to be a spotter it seems like those guys got a uh, a very intense but pretty sweet gig mm-hmm. yeah that's true that's good i was actually a scorer and yeah forget that i can't do that <laughs> and the track for one car i could the Gosh. tracks that we got to set up like at bristol when you set up in the suites and uh-huh. scored from there it was fine when you were in the infield like at charlotte and darlington right. yeah. And Rockingham, well, Rockingham changed, but originally it was in the field. It's like you literally sat there, like you had no idea what was going on <laughs> yeah. on the racetrack, right? Until your car yeah. came by. Yeah, yeah. I, I could score one car, like you'd have to score it and then write down whatever time the clock said and all of that every time yeah. it went by. No problem. I, I couldn't. I, I tried to score like a ten car, like modified race one time, mm. and it okay. was a disaster. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's hard enough with one car. Yeah, yeah. I can imagine. To me, that would be very boring. Mm. It was really not boring unless you were in the infield. And, you know, I had a headset so you could hear, like, everything else. that You could hear the spotters and everything that was going on in the race. But still, you couldn't tell until your car came around and you... I'd have it way too many so squirrel moments. Archaic. When you think about <laughs> Me too. It, so. Yeah, I couldn't do it. I, you know, it's, it's, it's easily distracted as I get. I'd be like, I might have missed oh, about man. fifty of a three hundred lap have race. To be super yeah. focused. Yeah, I guess. All right. So yeah, oh, we right, got Dave, time for one more question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Is it really? Yeah. yeah. This is awesome. Time flies when you're having fun. Yeah. Man. Do you want um, me to ask but, the last question? Yeah. Go ahead. From yeah, Scott. If, if it's all right with Brad. Felt. Yeah, sure. I, I'm as long as you, I'll stay forever. All right, cool. <laughs> Scott yeah. Felthausen. Yes. Am I saying that right? Yeah. If Mr. Gilly could put together a broadcast team together of past and or present radio personalities, who would be in the booth? Who would be in the turns? And who would be in the pits? Mm. Ah, wow, that's a great. It question. is a great question, and and quite honestly, I I do, and, and this is going to sound like such a cop out answer, but I I love our PRN crew. <laughs> But if I could take our current PRN crew and if I could bring back Buddy Baker Mm -hmm. and have him up in the booth um, with Doug and Mark in the analyst role, um, would love to do that. Because if you had a race where, you know, they were just kind of logging laps for a while, Buddy would have a story. Mm -hmm. If you had a report from Pitt Road, Buddy would have the reason why, you know, (laughs) what you were reporting and and all of those things. And I I just I think that would just be amazing to have someone with his um, racing and life experience, you know, back with us. And speaking of Buddy, my dad remembers getting on Buck Baker's bus in Charlotte. He was a bus driver, a city bus yeah. driver yeah. down in Charlotte. <laughs> Your dad was or and, Buck was? My, my, Buddy's dad. Buddy's, Buddy's dad, dad, Buck. Buck. Yeah. So my dad said that they, I'd say, well, where would you go, dad? My dad's got Alzheimer's now, kind of, uh, but he's he still remembers stuff pretty yeah. good. He was saying, well, we just go down to the, to the mall or down across into town, into mm-hmm. Charlotte. He said he would just pick us up and take us it was down. Probably and the he said, I'll, Mall. He said, I'll come back and pick you up later and we'll go back home. <laughs> you know, stuff like that. So yeah. he grew up right down there where the uh, R- R- Robert Yates Racing was. Mm-hmm. I was going to say the Marita Bread Plant. 
there's a picture in the Charlotte Observer, probably in the 50s, I guess, when they were building that Merida plant down there. And he was up on top of this dirt mound. Wow. So, yeah, he grew up right in that area. So. Yeah, yeah. Buddy said his dad, you know, would get commentary from the weekend. Um, you know, I mean, people would be getting on the bus, and, it, and and you wouldn't know. I mean, it could be, you know, someone who looked like, you know, they were, a, you know, a, a middle-aged male race fan, or it could be just like, you know, the the, the old lady who's um, having trouble climbing up the stairs, but yeah. he would get commentary on the races. I'm sure. And I asked Good my dad, I was like, so who, how, how did, did you know he was a, a race car driver, you know, but... He said, yeah, because we knew he, he ran around here, local tracks, and he, he was winning and all this stuff. So, you know, we kind of wanted to get on that bus. So yeah. that's pretty cool. That is cool. Yeah. I like that. Sat down last uh, weekend and talked to him about We're it. We're lucky we grew up here. For we sure. We really are. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yep, no Absolutely. place better, I don't think, to get as far. So when I was a kid, we had wrestling and racing. I mean, that was <laughs> yeah. it. You know, really. And, Just and, the two R's. Yeah, I mean, that's it. Two R's, yes. <laughs> and ACC basketball. And, and, I mean, I would be in the swimming pool down at Subtle Swimming Pool and on Wilkinson Boulevard just right up from the holiday Inn that donnie allison was telling us that they used to hang out with when there's charlotte race time and uh i'd be at that swimming pool and there would be um one of the uh the russians the ivan nikola oh, yeah, ivan yeah. and nikita koloffs <laughs> would be floating around there yeah yeah like, like andre the giant like his his yeah. wife i think worked at the charlotte motor speedway ticket office for a long time okay how about I that i didn't know that right. i think i remember yeah. that huh. yes <laughs> so that was wrestling and race and roddy piper i knew where he lived and I knew Ricky Steamboat was down there and, and, and all these guys. So, anyway, yeah, I loved it. And, uh, but my favorite driver was uh, David Pearson and Kelly Yarborough, and I would argue with the Richard Petty fan on the school bus when I was going into <laughs> kindergarten or whatever. So, you know, that was the thing. That's awesome. But it was like Richard Petty was winning everything back then. So, you know, yeah, I had David Pearson. Of course, and who knew you would David Pearson, grow yeah. up to be like, yeah, yeah kind of a big deal. Yeah. Well, I hadn't, I hadn't, yeah, there you go. What the, like the <laughs> science is, yes. Uh, <laughs> kind of a big deal. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, that's that's funny there. So, Oddly um, enough, the first person that kind of caught my attention after Earnhardt was Tim Richmond. Oh, oh yeah, Tim yeah. Richmond. So interesting, I'm a, interesting Another person. guy with a lot of swagger. A lot of swagger and a lot mm -hmm. of talent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for uh, sure. It was sort of uh, wasted. Yeah. So yeah. Last, last week on Facebook, a buddy of mine put a hat and it was the Folgers coffee, and it was a mm -hmm. hat signed by Tim Richmond. Yeah. It's a white hat. Yeah. And he said, who wants this hat? And I'm like, yeah, right. I said, very nice. You know, I just did a thumbs up. Very yeah. nice. And then another one of my friends, uh, Beer Man's wife, Scott uh, Trevison, mm -hmm. they're not, they're at the racetrack tonight. They're camping hey, out. Yeah. Well, they're hey, camping Jenna. out. Hey, Is she Jenna. watching out? They're camping out in the infield right now. So, yeah. uh, but anyway, she, she wrote on there, she said, Scott would love to have it for his uh, man cave. And she said, and then he said, it's yours. <laughs> and I'm like, are you serious? I yeah. said, I'll just comment it on there that I'm like, no, he's not giving this away. There's just no way. <laughs> That's but, funny. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I never did get to meet Tim Richmond, but that would have been cool. I. Yeah. yeah. It was before my time. Yeah. It is cool, though, when someone gets yeah. a souvenir like that, mm -hmm. when a souvenir like that goes to someone who really wants it. Yeah. I and think that's, that's the, awesome. I agree. And that's why I'm okay with it, because I got enough yeah. stuff, and, and he does have his mm -hmm. the man cave yeah. stuff's everywhere. So I actually did good. meet Tim Richmond. Oh, you did? I did. Mm. did, and he, he's did he hit very on? strange. Yeah. Did he make a pass at you? I should he say. made a pass at everybody. Okay. <laughs> Either way, I mean, any direction. <laughs> so if he met like, me, he would have. Yeah, yeah, I'm whatever. <laughs> I have a story, yes. but I'll tell you off the air. Uh, off oh, the air. Yes. Oh, okay. Oh, one of those. Okay. Yeah. So Jenna says hello from Daytona International Speedway. Say the hey. truck race is underway. Hey, awesome. Jenna. <laughs> John Hunter Nemechek is leading the pack. Good deal. I oh, very know, cool. That's awesome. With three laps to go for the uh, second stage. That makes me feel old. I'm, I'm going to get uh, John does. Hunter in here. It's I messaged Almost day 30. Yeah, yeah ask him about yeah, the, yeah. the, the yeah. ghost in the Nemechek race shop. Okay. You know what? I've heard of that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, and I'm going to have to ask him about that. <laughs> All right. I'll ask him. I'll remember it. So, um, yeah. I, I was uh, I Jack for his dad. I was his Jack man. An engine builder back in the day. For oh, really? The, uh, um, back when he won Texas? Well, the front row Joe. This was before was Texas. Was that the Bell South? He, was, he won loud and, and different things. The yeah. Bell South car, yeah. Yeah. And his, uh, How do I remember and the Bush that? car. Uh-huh. 87 Bush car, yeah. Yeah. We won some races in that car. Yeah, he, he won Texas one year. And in, in, in maybe not in that same era or that same iteration, but yeah. yeah. I always thought that was cool. Yeah, that was some good times with that car because we, we could come into the pits um, – 15th or 20th and then go out and like the top five you know and oh like, yeah see that makes you feel good especially when you're jumping over the wall yes yeah that's <laughs> so awesome we did that a lot of times but we were the cup crew coming to, to do 
the bush races back then. Yeah, that's cool. But anyway, so um, well, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Well, thank and you, Brad. I appreciate the invite. This you, has been yeah. fantastic. If you got more stories you want to tell us, um, just carry on. Because somebody did ask what was the Earnhardt story. Did you see that question? Uh, no. and, and we didn't ask the uh, Sterling Marlin. Did you have any Sterling Marlin stories? No, but, and that one might have been a little bit. I don't really have any Sterling stories. Yeah. Um, I just. <laughs> they got to be clean, though, right? That's, well, that, <laughs> that's true. Nobody asked a Sterling. Actually, I take that back. I have a great Sterling Marlin story. To be yeah. honest. With you. So this is the this is 2002. This is for Scott. All Harrison. right. This is 2002. This is when I'm, uh, you know, managing the fire and EMS, also kind of running the operations that happen in the infield of the racetrack, mm -hmm. and. Uh, Sterling's coming down to do a Goodyear tire test when he's driving for Chip Ganassi. This was the year that they were leading the points for most of the season until mm -hmm. he broke his back and ended right. up having to win, uh, miss races. And then Jamie yeah. McMurray comes out and wins at Charlotte in like his second start in that I car. Know, yes. So we're going, we're trying to drive the track and I'm out there in my Silverado and, and we're doing everything we can. And it's like, you can only do so much. Well, they're all very impatient. Sterling wants to get out there on the mm -hmm. track and go run. And they have, they had a gold Coors Light car with them because there was, and, and I, it, there was a special paint scheme that they were doing, but this was only the Goodyear tire test car. And, you know, I'm mm -hmm. all enamored, um, you know, my geekdom of all of the things that happen tech <laughs> yeah. behind the scenes of what's mm -hmm. going on. And uh, so I'm going around the track and I'm up high on the banking in one and two in my Silverado, and I look over, and Sterling has pulled up next to me. Yeah. And we're probably doing like 80 or so. <laughs> and he's got the window down, and he's on my left side, so he's hanging out the window across the race car. Oh, gosh. And meanwhile, I'm going, just keep it straight. Don't wreck. Don't do anything, you know. <laughs> yes. and, and, you know, we're not really going that fast. And here's Sterling trying to talk to me, you know, and we're sitting there going around the turns. But, um, you know, so he was there for, you know, the better part of a couple of days and was mm -hmm. just a really good guy. There were some really cool things, like Goodyear was trying out some cambered tires, like the tire wasn't flat across. The tire itself had oh. camber built into it. It was wow. things that never made it, but right. it was cool to see some of those things that were going on. Yeah, that's mm. interesting. Yeah, it might have been their uh, banquet beer car or something. They <laughs> might have been. Yeah, there was. Some, I just but, remember uh, and and then seeing the paint scheme later on. Yeah. But we had some of the uh, coolest paint schemes back then. The mm -hmm. Silver Bullet, and then we had the uh, Brooks and Dunn car. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then we had the John Wayne car. Yep, I and remember that the banquet beer car. Everyone has a Sterling story. Yeah. Everyone. Yeah, yeah. Now I've heard a lot of good Sterling stories that we probably can't We've tell here. We've had a lot on yeah, David's sure. show. We have. Already. You got that right. I mean, it's yeah. Really funny. <laughs> yeah, I know. Sometimes they slip up and and stuff gets said, but it's yeah. all it's all good. Though. It's like you want to hear a good like Dave Marcus story, but Sterling has yeah. like yeah. all the mm -hmm. wingtip speed. Yeah. I, you could say he's. I mean, well, he has won many races, but who was it that said Carl Long? Maybe I don't know. It said we may have never won a race, but we won a lot of parties or something. Like that. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> that's funny. Oh, that's Heck, good. that might even be a Kyle yeah. Petty quote, even yeah. though he did win yeah, races. Yeah, exactly. I think he won eight, but you could say um, we won <laughs> races and we won a lot of parties. Yeah, he won eight hundred parties. Mm -hmm. Yes, so. <laughs> that's right. Uh, Jana said, "David, you snooze, you lose." Talking about the hat, of course. Oh. Ah. And uh, actually, Scott has an awesome man cave. Yes, and Tim's hat from Bob will be a great addition. Yes, I know. You're rubbing it in. Wow, this is oh, awesome. Yeah. Yes. Well, he, they're really good friends of mine. They're some of the best friends I've ever had in my life. So when I go down there and visit with them, I'll get to hang out with it. With the Tim Richmond hat, you'll get yes. to wear the hat. Very cool. Yes. Perhaps you'll get to wear the hat. And maybe I can be wear sure it. to take a picture yeah. and send it. I will. I'll do yeah. that. The and, and little people in your life. So yeah. yesterday, <laughs> little people. Yes. <laughs> yesterday, I got up in my attic and I found a box that has been sealed for twenty years, and it's my NASCAR memorabilia. <sighs> I found stuff that I. Did not remember having. Why was it sealed Very cool. for 20 years? Well, because I went through two moves, and I taped it up, and mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, that's my NASCAR stuff. It's going in the attic. But I've got more boxes. I'll set it up one day. I'll make a display. Yeah, yeah. I mean. Uh, I got a bunch of those boxes. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So, and, and one of them was a piston from Sterling Marlin's car when I had built an engine for Atlanta, and we, and we finished eighth. And I don't remember the significance of that, but I got the piston <laughs> and I got it. Sterling to sign it. Yes. Maybe you had to sneak it yes. out of the racetrack before the inspector saw uh -huh. it. Maybe that yeah. was it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So anyway, a bunch of other stuff, a wrench from it has 42 on it. Don't tell anybody though. I got that, um, 42 engraved. All right. So that's it. Thanks that's so much it. for joining no, us. No, thank yeah, you. This well, has been so much you. fun. Thank you, Brad. Really enjoyed it. Thanks for coming. Yeah. To well, you're Thanks. welcome to yeah. come back. Good um, to see you. Yeah. Likewise. Come back anytime. Yeah, we'd, we'd be happy to. This is fun. Yeah, so we'll, and we can uh, we can even mix it up. Have uh, you can bring a guest with you, or yeah. uh, you know, come in whenever one of your 
favorite drivers it's going to be in. Yeah, one of these like days that. we'll get Hammond to tell the true story of that first all-star race and the engine blown up at the start finish line. Uh, oh, and if yes. we can get Doug Rice uh, to stay up this late. Let's oh, Doug, Doug would. I'd love to get Doug up. Doug would absolutely be, love to be so happy to come fun. out here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we could we could definitely talk about that uh, win there because I've heard different things, but that'll be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wonder if the uh, statute of limitations is over by now. You can I don't, talk you know, about here's it. the thing. Like, I, one thing I've discovered that is a constant with most NASCAR competitors, and I don't yeah. know if they're still afraid that they're going to get caught or they're just embarrassed if someone thinks that they cheated to win. I mean, right. let's be honest with you, everyone's bent the rules. Yes. But they, like, it, it, it is like denial is just built into their system. <laughs> yes. There was nothing wrong with that engine. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it was made to go that many laps. What are you talking about? Yeah. Oh. Uh, Oh, the, the, and except for that, yeah, that many laps exactly to the finish line, right? Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, they, they yeah, always give Jeff a hard time about it's that. It's all good, though, yeah, man. I love going through the NASCAR Hall of Fame and seeing all the all the, uh, the different things that they have on display in there, the yes. intake manifolds and all that stuff. It's awesome to see that. So, But anyway, um, I guess we'll wrap it up now. So, everybody, make sure you hit that subscribe, hit that like, so you'll, be, you'll know every time I go live here, which is typically on a Monday evenings at 7 o'clock, and also check out my Facebook page, Racing Roots with Ham. And you can find me on Twitter, Instagram at dhamiam, as well as yourself. What is your Instagram? Your just just Brad Gilly, uh, G I L L I E. Mm -hmm. Pretty simple. And Twitter. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, sir. And then your YouTube channel that you're maybe yeah you. that you know we'll, we'll yes. see. I, I've 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 we'll see. Maybe well, maybe Brad on the road will start to uh, make yeah. an appearance. There you go. Well, you can see the video I was talking about on his uh, YouTube channel mm -hmm. at least, and mine as well. So. Uh, but thanks to Jersey Cape Yachts, and thanks, everybody, so much for tuning in. And we will see you all back here next Monday for Ted Musgrave. Uh, he'll be right here in the studio with us. So make sure you got your questions ready and your comments and all that good stuff. Uh, so we'll see you all back next week. Good night. Welcome to Racing Roots with Ham. If you don't know our host, David Ham, he's a 25-year NASCAR veteran, engine builder, and jack man. Live every Monday evening, we have a new guest from the racing world with their stories, their paths, their, their racing, racing roots. roots. Sponsored by Jersey Cape Yachts. Check them out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and their YouTube channel. Also on JerseyCapeYachts.com. Be sure to hit that subscribe, turn on the bell notification, so you'll be notified every time we go live. Now here's our host, David Hamm.